So here it is, Sony's brand new ZV-E10. And what's so cool about this tiny little mirrorless camera with an APS-C size sensor is that it starts at $700 for the body or with the kit lens, it's around $800. Well, technically it's $699.99 or $799.99. They, they make it one cent cheaper. But my point is for a sub $1,000 camera, you get a lot of features out of here. You get a nice solid 4K that's down sampled from 6K. You get some great slow-mo capabilities, 120 frames per second. Of course, you have your interval shooting, which can be used for time lapses. And just like any other Sony mirrorless camera, you have a ton of manual control. If we take a look inside, we have a APS-C size sensor in there. It's actually the same sensor and image processor as you would get out of the Sony A6600, which is two times the cost of this E10. So pretty good bang for the buck you're getting here. Let's go ahead and fire this thing up while Dylan tells us about our sponsor, Storyblocks. Hi there, I'm Dylan from the Potato Jet channel, but you already knew that from this awesome lower third I got from Storyblocks. There's an old filmmaking saying that goes, you should show, not tell. So instead of just telling you how much I get angry when my football team keeps losing, I'll just express it like this. Sound effects courtesy of Storyblocks. Wow, what a beautiful day at the beach. You know, how would you like it if I just pulled out my ukulele and just started singing Kumbaya? Hell no, I ain't got time for that. Instead, I'm just gonna go to Storyblocks where they have over a million royalty-free stock assets and I'm just gonna find footage of a guy playing it for me easier than actual effort. All you need is one affordable all access subscription plan and you'll have access to unlimited royalty free downloads. That way you can get rid of that ukulele you pretend how to know how to play. Click the link below and start your dreams today. And my very first impressions with this is that it's tiny, especially with this little kit lens. It's a 16 to 35 and extends out and you can actually use the zoom rocker to zoom in and out, but also it's super lightweight. Of course, us YouTubers are all about that flip screen. Now, in terms of brightness on this display, you can switch it over to the sunny setting, which which is great because even if it's bright outside, you can still see the screen, but it is pretty misleading when it comes to exposure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm blown out here, huh? How's this look to you? Blown out? Oh yeah, look at my face. Yeah, so you know what's weird about that is the footage actually doesn't look terribly blown out, but on this LCD, it looks really, really blown out. So that's the one thing that I will say about Sony cameras is that their LCD just isn't as reliable. Yeah, it was like we were in an African safari because all we saw was zebras. <laughs> <laughs> now taking a look at the body, it looks pretty familiar. You have your on off record button right here, zoom rocker, and this is the background defocus button. So check it out, we have Sam in front of the camera and if we want the background to be nice and blurry, I'm just gonna tap that defocus button and oh, look at that. And it's going to do that by just adjusting the settings. It's gonna open up that aperture wide open and adjust the ISO and shutter speed accordingly. It's cool, but it's not a feature that I personally use very often because I'm usually using manual mode. So if I want that blurry background, I'm just manually doing it. This only really works if you're using auto exposure. But the other cool button that I'm happy to see on here that the ZV-1 had is product showcase. So check this out. So this is actually pretty cool. So Sam, can you showcase a product to us? Oh, what's that? This right here. What, what, what is that? Yeah, there you go, it's a pen, bro. But it's in the shape of a little pill and it just collapses like that. It's adorable, look at it. You would carry that around with you. Like imagine if somebody asks you, like, hey, do you have a pen? I'm like, yeah, for sure, bro, here you go. And they're gonna be like, what? I said for a pen, yeah, this, this is a pen. Idiot. And then you like open it up and you're like, shh, pen. Okay, I guess that's cool, but you, you notice how it was out of focus, right? Now I'm gonna turn product showcase on and can you show us that pen again? Oh yeah, for sure. So check this out. Whoa. Uh, Pretty sick, right? What is that? Is that also a pen? Yeah, dude, check that out, look. How many okay. pens do you have that are in the shape of some scary device? Seven. Seven? <laughs> <laughs> Basically the product showcase feature assumes that you're going to show something to the camera and as soon as you bring it into the foreground, it's gonna rack focus on that. Opposed to something like face detect, which is always going to prioritize faces, so. Pretty handy little feature, I think. Now by default, this camera actually comes with a little bit of this digital beautification turned on. So right now it actually is on a bit. You can kind of see it maybe here. I'm gonna turn it off, so let's see what that looks like. Oh my God, I'm just kidding. It's, it doesn't really look that different, but this is with nothing. But if we turn it up to high, I don't know if I see anything. Is it applied in post maybe? Oh, you see it when you look back on the clip. Oh my 
gosh. Okay. Do not put it on high. I learned that the hard way. What are you talking about though? You look beautiful. No, nah, my skin is beautiful as it is. All caramel. I moisturize three times a day. This is what beauty mode low looks like. Have you ever actually used the beautification mode in Cara? No, but I have a couple of ants that would love this. All right, and we're finally starting to settle into the new place. I mean, we've still got lots of work to do, but let's talk about slow motion real quick. This can do full HD at up to 120 frames per second. It does maintain that autofocus during that slow motion, which is nice and useful. Easy switching into that mode because that S and Q button is just right there. So you tap it, you're in 120. And yeah, the higher end cameras are starting to go up to 240 in full HD. But honestly, for the most part, 120p is enough to satisfy my super slow-mo needs. I will admit though, I did jump the gun a little bit when it came to demolishing that kitchen. I had all the numbers in my head, but I never actually took all the renovations we were gonna do and, and put it on a spreadsheet is what I should have done. I would have seen that gigantic number at the bottom and I probably would have pumped the brakes before I completely destroyed the, the kitchen. But you know, this is how it's going to be for a little bit, but hey, it still works. I mean, the fridge is still plugged in. I mean, this still works. We don't have counters, but we got this little folding table that it works for now, maybe the next couple months, maybe a year. We'll see how long it takes to get a new kitchen in there. Now, one of the great things about this is that there is no record time limit. There's a lot of cameras out there that cut right around the 30 minute mark. So if you're recording long interviews or events, you're just gonna plant the camera, let it roll for an hour or so, this can handle it. And right now it's at room temperature and it's been rolling at 4K24 straight for about an hour and 20 minutes. And I do see a little overheating icon pop up, but it seems like it's gonna get through this entire battery without actually overheating and shutting itself down. Of course, I took it, threw it in this incubator, set it to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, so simulating a pretty hot day, and it overheated in about 18 and a half minutes. But here's the thing that's kind of weird about this camera and the overheating. This room right here is set to 75 degrees, so I basically hit record, and then I toss it in there, and then it heats up from room temperature, and that's where I got about 18 and a half minutes. And then I restarted the test after the camera's been kind of cooking in there for a little bit. And you would think that it wouldn't last as long, but just like the A6600 used to do, it lasted 34 and a half minutes. So it actually lasts longer if it starts already warm. Now I would usually never use the internal microphone, but what's cool about this is it comes with a little fuzzy microphone protector for the wind, which just slips into your hot shoe and protects the wind. So that actually might make this internal microphone usable because last thing you want is, I'm gonna go ahead and take it off, just hear this all day. Worst sound ever, right? I hate that. Some people fall asleep to that. <laughs> so there's your microphone right there and then this little fuzzy thing just slips into that hot shoe right there. And this is also the multi-interface shoe. So if you have a Sony microphone, you could just plug that straight in. You also have your mic port up here and you also get a headphone jack right here on the bottom. So it's good that you have options, but the audio quality out of this internal microphone does seem a little bit light and a little bit hollow to me, but I'll let you guys decide for yourself what you think of the audio quality between the internal mic on here and the Rode Video Mic Pro Plus. I think it just sounds fuller and also much more directional. Six feet away, this is how the Rode Video Mic Pro Plus sounds and here's how the Sony ZV-E10's internal microphone sounds. And one of the things that's nice about Sony cameras as opposed to something like Canon is they give you a ton of control, anything from normal to HLG2, even S-Log3, although I wouldn't use S-Log3 on here because we're stuck at 8-bit. It's still pretty good 8-bit, 100 megabits per second, but I would stick to HLG2 if you're trying to get that dynamic range or just turn it off completely if you just want to use the image straight out of camera. They've been working on their menu to try to make it less complicated, but I still think there's way too much stuff on here. I mean, like I, I've studied this menu for hours and I still don't know half the stuff is like this. Yeah, what is that? I, yeah, I'm just trying to shoot a TikTok, dude. Don't get me wrong. I do love how many options that they give you. You know, you can live stream with it and stuff like that. All gravy, but I just wish that I didn't have to like dig
dig through a massive pile of a hoarder of a menu just to change my frame rate. I definitely recommend taking your favorite items and just tossing them all in here so you never have to go ah, ah, ah. <laughs> or maybe what they should do is like take all the advanced items on the menu and just put it in one bin. Like 80% of the menu should go in this advanced menu and everything else would just be so much nicer and cleaner. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Like you think the dude who designed the menu is a hoarder at home? Like his friends come over and it's like, why do you have like nine toasters? In case one breaks, I have eight more. Now here's how the internal microphone sounds when we're out and vlogging. And this is what a girl's voice sounds like. Hi, girl voice here. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is probably the settings I would be using. I'm using the 10 to 18 Miller. Miller. Got an ND filter up front and I'm shooting 4K 24. Now, if you like shooting 30p, at 4K 30, there is a crop and there's also a crop at 120p, but the active image stabilization definitely adds a whole lot. So if I wanted to get even wider than this, I could. Here, let me turn off image stabilization real quick. And there, so much wider but I just don't think it's gonna be stabilized enough. So I would probably keep it on and deal with that crop. It's a pretty big crop, by the way. Today, we're also funding the seventh video. It's all part of the potato farm project. If you missed it a little while back, basically, if you have a really cool idea and you just need funding to get it going, whether it's an Instagram video or a YouTube channel or whatever, just let me know your idea in the Google Doc below and every once in a while, we'll be funding them. This one comes to us from Jackson Blair, Salt Lake City. His idea is a YouTube channel called I'm Sh at. <laughs> he says, I go through all the things in my life I'm not good at and there's a lot. And explain the steps I took to get better as well as the impact it's had, things that didn't work, etc. I think that's a really cool concept because it's motivation to try new things, learn new things and just improve. I mean, that's what it's about, right? We're constantly getting better as people, learning more things. Love it. First half of the payment already sent over and maybe in the next video, your concept will be the one that's funded. So link down there in the description. Anyways, uh, camera, that's right. Now, I think my favorite thing about this camera is the combination of the size, the weight, and the amount of power you get out of it for its price. Of course, it's a mirrorless camera, and with E-mounts, you can really grow and improve with this camera. If I start doing more multi-cam shoots, I can definitely see myself picking up a few of these and planting them all around the room so I can intercut. Now, my least favorite thing is probably the stabilization. I mean, yeah, it has that active image stabilization, but it crops so much into the frame. And I just don't feel like I'm getting a stable enough image. I mean, this is my A7S and it has IBIS, which stands for in-body image stabilization. And check it out, if I drank a gallon of coffee and I'm jittering, you could actually see the sensor kind of shifting around in there independently from the body. So I'm kind of spoiled with the IBIS. Of course, if you have a lens with really good stabilization or a gimbal or a tripod, you have nothing to really worry about. Oh, but it is compatible with Catalyst Brow. So if you shoot completely unstabilized, then you can run it through their software where it's free and it super stabilizes the footage. So I actually got a Cinelifter, which is like a, a big FPV drone that carries cameras like this. And I was thinking, do I really want to put my A7S III on there? No, I'm going to put this thing on there. I'm going to shut off all the stabilization off in here and just use Catalyst Browse, which uses the gyro data of the camera. So it's actually pretty good. It's just an extra step to do so. Plus you have to make sure that you're shooting at a pretty high shutter speed. So it's something that you kind of have to plan ahead for. Now, who is this camera not for? I would actually say, if you're just looking for a camera to just grab and just start filming, you don't know what ISO is or shutter speed and you don't care to learn, avoid it because this is a camera that takes a little bit of work to make it look good. Opposed to something like an iPhone or a lot of Canon cameras, you know, you just turn it on, hit record and everything looks okay and everything sounds okay. For example, one of the things that I think a beginner camera should have is auto audio level control. So, you know, when you're in a loud place, it should automatically lower the sensitivity of that microphone so everything's not blown out. And also when you're in a really quiet place, it should boost that sensitivity, right? But this camera, I don't think has it. I mean, maybe it's somewhere deep down in the menu, but as far as I know, you have to manually control it. That doesn't really bother me because I always manually control my audio levels anyways, but Sometimes people just wanna pull a camera out of the box and have it look pretty damn good. I tried vlogging with it a bit with the out of box settings and I can't say I liked the results. It's just the shutter speed was running crazy. I didn't really have trust in the stabilization. I would see the rolling shutter and all that. I think the whole world of consumer cameras are completely shifting because phones look so freaking good now. Honestly, at this point, I think if you're shooting everything auto, you're probably gonna get better results out of your phone. But if you're willing to spend the time and effort to learn all the shutter speed 
and the picture profiles and how to color grade it and what kind of filters to put up front and lenses, all that stuff, you could really get some professional looking stuff that you cannot get out of a phone. So depending on what you're looking for and what you're hoping to get out of the camera, this could either be a camera that you're like, what the f my phone looks better, or you might be able to put some good lenses on it. And this can look really, really good. Just because it can look good doesn't mean it will look good. Again, it's all about you know your idea, your vision, and learning the tools and how to use it properly. But the potential of this thing, really high. At least that's my take on it. Thanks for watching all the way to the very end of the video. Oh my gosh, you guys are awesome. Link down there in the description if you wanna buy it, affiliate link, so you'll be helping me pay for this kitchen if you buy a camera using the link. All right, see you guys later.